Hello, everyone. Welcome back to CRIM 2080, Introduction to Forensic Science. So in this lecture, we're going to be talking um, about the Amanda Knox case and the murder of Meredith Kircher. So with that, I will share the screen and we can get started. All right. So Amanda Knox was an American exchange student studying in Perugia, Italy. And she was living with British exchange student Meredith Kircher, who was murdered on November 1st, 2007. On this night, uh, Amanda claimed to have been uh, with her boyfriend at his house, Raffaele Sosalicito. Uh, and in the morning, she then wanted to go back to her house and change, uh, take a shower, but she returned to her home uh, under suspicious circumstances. So her house had the front door open and she saw a uh, little amounts of blood in the bathroom, but she didn't make much of it. She still took her shower, so she still changed and she didn't get um, worried or notice anything was wrong until she saw that there was feces in the toilet. And at this point, she thought that someone was in their home with them. So she looked around, she didn't find anyone, but she did find that Meredith's store was locked. So afraid she called her boyfriend to come and try to get the door unlocked and see if Meredith was okay. She wasn't responding to them. When they failed to get the door unlocked, they called the police who then arrived and uh, opened the door and found Meredith's body. What was particularly noted was uh, noted by witnesses and investigators was that Amanda was behaving weird. They stated that she was uh, being touchy with her boyfriend, they were hugging, they were kissing, and they found that this behavior was odd because she had just discovered that her roommate was murdered. So this is a crime scene. Uh, this is where Meredith's body was found. This is her room. Uh, she was found partially clothed with uh, her throat cut. And if you want to watch the investigators walk through the scene, uh, you can go ahead and click on this link. It's about a 22 minute long video uh, of the investigators walking through the scene and making their observations on camera. You can also take note, um, take particular note of whether or not they're wearing PPE uh, is their search organized, unorganized, uh, things like that. There's also a documentary on the Amanda Knox case on Netflix. So if you're interested in the case, you can go ahead and watch that as well. Okay, so Amanda and Raffaele were questioned by the police for days. They, because of the odd behavior that Amanda was exhibiting, the police took particular interest in them. So originally they stated that they were both at Raffaele's home the night of the murder. Raffaele then changed his statement to state that Amanda had left his house at some point during the night and then returned around 1 a.m. After Amanda heard this, uh, in combination with the police interpreting a text that she sent to her boss, Patrick Lumumba, which she thought meant see you later in Italian, but the police interpreted it as some sort of commitment to meet later. So instead of an innocent and casual, oh, I'll see you next time I come into work, the police interpreted the statement uh, in Italian that she was committing to meet him that night. So Amanda then figures, oh, maybe I forgot I met him some point at some point in the night. And she accused uh, her boss, Patrick Lumumba, then of the murder of Meredith Kircher. So um, Patrick Lumumba was then investigated and his alibi was corroborated and he was let off. Uh, they stopped to the investigation into him. Amanda later uh, made the claim that she was being bullied and beaten in police custody for not providing investigators with the response they wanted. Uh, and she later recanted her statement uh, accusing Lumumba of the murder, stating that she just made it uh, because she was exhausted and because of the police pressure and the bullying and beatings that she was uh, obtaining while in police custody. So after Lumumba's alibi was corroborated because Knox had then lied, they 
uh, arrested Knox and Solicito for the murder of Meredith Kircher. Also on the same day, new fingerprint evidence was discovered at the scene that belonged to a man named Rudy Guede. Now Guede had previously been uh, uh, accused and arrested for alleged break-ins, one at a lawyer's office and one that he was actually arrested four days before Kircher's uh, murder in Milan, Italy for breaking into a nursery school. And in both cases, he was found with a knife on him. So Guede wanted to fast track his trial in order to keep it separate from the Knox and Solicito trial. And he actually admitted to being in the apartment but denied any involvement in the murder. So he stated that he and Kircher had kissed and touched but didn't have any sexual intercourse because they didn't have any condoms with them. Uh, he also claimed that he had developed stomach pains while at the house and went to the bathroom. And while he was in the bathroom, he heard Kircher scream. So when he went back to the room, he saw a shadowy figure holding a knife over uh, Meredith's body as she was bleeding, who then fled the scene. The court stated that his version of the events didn't match the forensic evidence that they discovered at the scene. Uh, and furthermore, he couldn't explain why one of his palm prints, which was stained in Kircher's blood, had been found on a pillow under uh, Kircher's disrobed body. So Guede in October of 2008 was found guilty of the murder and sexual assault of Kircher and provided a, or given a 30 year sentence. So just because now Guede was found guilty that didn't stop the investigation into Knox and Solicito. What the prosecution proposed was that Knox, Solicito and Guede all worked together in this murder and assault. So they theorized that Knox had attacked Kircher in the bedroom uh, and then they held her down for Guede to sexually assault her. Knox then used a knife to stab her and cut her throat. And then once she was dead, they took mobile phones uh, and money in order to fake a burglary and stage this as a burglary as opposed to a murder. So let's talk about some of the physical evidence that was found at the scene. So the first one was a broken window and like originally they thought it was a burglary. So they were thinking that the window was broken from the outside in so that the perpetrator could get into the house. What they later came to think was that instead of being broken from the outside in, it was broken from the inside out to stage it to look like a burglary. And their basis for this claim was that uh, there was pieces of broken glass on top of already displaced items and that there were some valuables in plain sight that hadn't been touched. So, uh, these are good observations to make, of course, uh, but isn't foolproof. So something that does need to be considered is that uh, the room was already messy prior to the window being broken. That way, even if it was broken from the outside in, there would still be glass on top of these items. So these are just things to consider. Another thing that we can do with uh, glass evidence, particularly broken glass evidence, is we can analyze it and actually determine which way uh, the direction of force was. So we can actually tell whether or not it was broken from the outside in or the inside out by looking at the cracks in the glass, which I don't think they actually did. So let's talk a little bit about that type of analysis. So we're gonna go through and talk about this um, a little more once we go into our glass trace evidence uh, lecture, but because it is pertinent to this case, I wanna talk about it now as well. So when glass breaks, there are two types of fractures that are formed, radial fractures and concentric fractures. So radial fractures result, uh, they're a result of the initial contact. So right, when glass is broken, there is an initial point of contact. It's just one area that the rock was thrown in or that something hit. It's not like we're shattering the entire glass at one time. 
So there's initial point of contact. And what radial fractures do is they radiate out from this point of contact and they form what are called radial fractures. And these cracks are going to begin and propagate on the opposite side of the force. So right, glass is uh, a three-dimensional object. It's going to have some sort of thickness involved with it. So it has a uh, side as the same side of the force and then a side that is opposite of the force. So these radial cracks are going to come on the opposite side of the force. See like this, how the opposite side is breaking. Those are what radial fractures are going to do. Concentric fractures are going to occur after the initial contact and they're a result of the glass buckling. So these are like concentric fractures. They're going to form kind of around the point of uh, contact. And they're going to begin and propagate on the same side of the force. So see here, so they're going to come on the same side, forming on the same side of the force. So they're forming on this side. So when we examine these radial and concentric fractures, we can actually provide information about the direction in which the glass was broken from. So in this uh, case, we would be able to tell whether it was broken from the outside in or the inside out. And what we have is what's called the 4R rule. This states that ridges on radial cracks form right angles on the reverse side of the force. So ridges, these are the ridges, these like striation looking things, those are ridges, sometimes also referred to as stress marks or stress fractures. Uh, remember these are radial cracks, so they're the ones that are radiating out from the point of contact. And they are forming on the reverse side of contact. So this, in this case, this is the reverse side of contact because this is the direction of force. So reverse, same side. And they form, so these ridges are going to form right angles with the reverse side. So see these ridges, they're going to form this right angle when it meets the reverse edge. That's how we can determine the direction of force. So um, before we move on, we are going to cover this again. Uh, once we get into our trace evidence lecture on glass, there's a specific lecture for glass, and we're going to cover these exact two same slides again. So if it didn't make sense this time, hopefully it will make sense the next time. And of course, if it still doesn't make sense then, uh, feel free to email me about any of the topics that aren't quite clear to you, and I can hopefully clear them up for you. All right, so let's move on to the next one. This was a bloody footprint that was found uh, on a bath mat in the bathroom. So the prosecution argued that this footprint was made by Rafaele Sosolicito. And this is because uh, they stated it was too small to have been left by Rudy Guede. However, after they uh, did a closer comparison of two feet, they found that the four foot region of the uh, of their feet, so this area of the foot, Guedes' foot was neither longer nor wider than Rafaele's, so they were the same length and width for this uh, front area of the foot. So what the prosecution was suggesting was inherently wrong. They also measured the print incorrectly. So remember when we have blood stains on an absorbent item such as a bath mat, the blood tends to spread out and appear wider than it actually was. This is what happened in this instance. So the blood in this instance from the second toe kind of uh, meshed in and blended in with the big toe. And this is important because the reason, another reason why the prosecution stated this was Rafaele's footprint and not Guede's was because of the width of the big toe. But since they didn't account for this uh, blending of blood and mix mixing of the blood stain, making it appear wider, it was inherently inaccurate and the measurement was inaccurate. The next item of evidence was Meredith's bra clasp. 
So her bra clasp was actually photographed and documented at the scene on November 2nd, but for some reason it wasn't collected as evidence until December 18th. In addition, it was also recovered four feet away from where it was originally photographed. So we have, um, we have a big issue here with our chain of custody then. We have a piece of evidence where we can't account for it for over a month. We have no idea what happened to it at the scene because they didn't collect it for some reason. Uh, and it was also then moved at the scene. So we have no idea what was going on with this piece of evidence, which should have uh, affected the admissibility in court. However, they still uh, use this item of evidence in court as well as the DNA they obtained from it. So of course, after they ran DNA, Meredith Kircher was found as the primary donor. That makes sense. It's her bra, it's her blood. So it makes sense that she is the major donor on this piece of evidence. What they also found was DNA consistent with so, uh, Solicito's blood or Solicito's DNA. Uh, so they stated that this was evidence that Solicito took part and partook in this crime and this murder. However, what the prosecution failed to mention was that there were also profiles obtained from two unknown males. So in addition to Solicito's DNA, they also obtained DNA from two unknown males. And this strongly suggested some sort of contamination that had occurred. Uh, so in a sense, Solicito's DNA could have been a result of contamination as well. In addition, the bra clasp couldn't be further tested by independent experts uh, because it was stored incorrectly, either intentionally or unintentionally. It was stored incorrectly and then the hooks rusted so they uh, couldn't examine it anymore. The next item of evidence we'll talk about is the knife that was discovered in the kitchen drawer of Rafael Solecito. Uh, and this was what, what the police claimed was a murder weapon. So on this, they found Kircher's DNA on the blood, very, very low levels of Kircher's DNA on uh, the blade, and then Knox's DNA on the handle. And this was the only physical evidence that linked Amanda Knox to this murder. There was no other physical evidence, no fingerprints, uh, no other DNA evidence, just the evidence on this knife handle, which can actually be easily explained, right? If this was found in uh, her boyfriend's kitchen and they often cook together, you can uh, imagine that her DNA is probably on the handle. If she handled it, it's only natural that her DNA was transferred onto the handle. What isn't as easily explained is Kircher's DNA on the blade. However, what we'll see is that this DNA from Kircher on the blade was in such low levels, it was uh, pushing the sensitivity of the instrument past the validated uh, levels. So essentially what happened was, uh, yes, her DNA was detected, but it wasn't detected at high enough levels to actually be uh, considered detected by this instrument. So let's talk a little bit about that here. So here we have our DNA profiles, uh, just one part of it. So this top part, this 15, 6, 8, this is the, uh, this is the allele call. This is the number of repeats in our STR. Then this bottom number is the intensity of our signal. And in order for, according to uh, our standards and our validation standards, in order for us to be consider uh, that we detected this allele, this number, this bottom number has to be above 60. So here we see some that aren't, some that are. So these ones that are, are considered detected. Uh, the ones that aren't, are not considered uh, to be detected as an STR allele. 
And you can see that they're, they're in pretty low uh, amounts of DNA on the evidence compared to reference samples. If you look at the intensity of the reference sample peak, we're in almost 3000s uh, RFU, that's the unit that we use, uh, compared to like 271. So the minimum number that we need here in this intensity is 60 RFU. So now let's look at the blade. This is where Kircher's DNA was found. Uh, so this blade had tested negative for blood. Uh, so when they did their presumptive test, it was negative, but they still thought let's run DNA anyways. Maybe our test just didn't detect the blood on it, but her DNA was still on it. So what they did was they still ran DNA and they got a profile. But if we take a look at the, uh, our intensity, the signal intensity, we see that it's pushing the instrument to read the low validated limits of detection. This number is never above 60 uh, anywhere in this part of the profile. And this is what we call a low copy number sample. Additionally, the prosecution also failed to repeat this finding. And replication is a very important part of the scientific process, right? In order to ensure that our results are valid and true, we need to be able to repeat this finding over and over again. That's why things like peer review journals and having other scientists replicate your results is so important in the scientific community. And the fact that they weren't able to repeat their result is a big red flag. So let's talk about some of the issues in this case. One of the big ones, of course, is contamination. So trace DNA was um, a big thing in this case, right, with the knife. Um, the trace DNA is any sample where there is uncertainty that may be associated with the crime itself. So essentially what this is, is there is a possibility that some sort of DNA transfer could have occurred either before the crime, as with the instance, say, they were using this knife to cook, Knox was holding it, and her DNA was transferred. Or after the crime, so this was investigator mediated, and this is some sort of uh, contamination that had occurred after the fact, uh, after collection, during examination. And it's very easy to leave traces of DNA. As you can see, our instruments, while yes, we have validated limits, can still detect very, very low levels of DNA. They're very sensitive. Our instruments are very sensitive and can detect very low levels of DNA. So we have to take into consideration these trace amounts of DNA that are not like visible in the sense of their blood evidence or something like that. It's just something like they touched it and they transferred DNA. We can still detect those levels of DNA so we have to consider trace DNA when we are taking our samples and when we are doing our examination and interpretation of our results. Another thing, uh, issue with this contamination in this case was that the international protocols for inspection, collection, and sampling of these evidence items were not followed. So they weren't wearing protective suits. They weren't changing their boots and gloves. This is a big issue, right? Just because we're wearing gloves doesn't mean we're not spreading uh, DNA evidence, right? So we just talked about how easy it is to uh, deposit trace amounts of DNA and touch DNA. So if we touch something, even if it's not a bloody object uh, and it's in the crime scene, so in this case, it was in their apartment or their house, uh, and of course, with Amanda living there, her DNA is probably all over the place. So if they touch something in one area and then go to the area where the body is and touch something else, they could have inadvertently transferred Amanda's DNA to something that didn't originally have her DNA on it. Maybe an easier example to imagine is say they were working on the body there, there's blood on, and so now their gloves have blood on it, they have Kircher's blood on it, but then they don't change them and they go off and do examine some other object. So now they've transferred 
uh, Meredith's blood to an object that was previously non-bloody. So that's really the importance of changing your gloves regularly, changing your boots regularly to make sure you're not spreading evidence in places it wasn't originally at. In addition, the lab also uh, examined numerous samples from Kircher uh, simultaneously. So when they were examining this knife, they also had other items of evidence, say the bloody bra, that also had Kircher's DNA on it out at the same time. So when we examine our items of evidence, we wanna do it one item at a time. We don't wanna have a bunch of items of evidence out at the same time. And we also wanna make sure that we aren't doing, um, we aren't extracting DNA and doing DNA with different items of evidence at the same time because this issue of contamination is, um, okay. Sorry about that. I think my Wi-Fi went out. Let me reshare the screen and we can try again. Okay, so because um, contamination is such a big issue, right? We don't wanna be examining items of evidence that we can potentially transfer uh, DNA from one to another. And that's the instance that they, the defense thinks happens here. Because Kircher's DNA was found in such low levels uh, it's doubtful that this was the actual murder weapon, given how much of her blood was at the scene. And so, and during a struggle, there had to have been a lot of her DNA on, right? Uh, my Wi-Fi is being uh, weird, so let me try one more time. So because, again, contamination is an issue, we don't want to examine two items of evidence at the same time. Uh, that could potentially contaminate. And that's what they think happened here, that some sort of uh, Kircher's DNA from another object was inadvertently transferred here and contaminated this knife evidence uh, because there was such low levels of her DNA found on the supposed murder weapon. All right. So another issue we have in this case is a potential instance of confirmation bias. So this is the tendency to interpret new evidence as confirmation of one's existing beliefs and theories. So this bias is most likely to occur in cases that are rushed or high profile, that have high detective interest and that are close calls. So for instance, let's take uh, Raffaele's footprint. So there could have been a close call in the measurement that they took that uh, because they were looking at Raffaele as a person of interest, they made a close call to uh, match to him as opposed to taking a more unbiased reading. So this case was rushed. It was very high profile uh, and had a lot of detective interest, right? This was an international case, an international incident where we had um, an American suspect and a British victim taking place in Italy. So there was a lot of global media attention surrounding this case that made it a very high profile case with a lot of detective interest. And there was also then this rush to get information out to the public. So in order for us to avoid bias, we need to first acknowledge that it exists. A lot of times in science, everyone's like, oh, it's objective. There is no bias in science, which is not true, right? Science is still performed by people who are innately biased. So in order for us to avoid this bias and mitigate any bias that can occur, we need to acknowledge that it exists. All right, the verdict. So on December 2009, uh, Knox and Solicito were convicted of murdering Meredith Kircher. Amanda was sentenced to 26 years and Raffaele was sentenced to 25 years. In June 2011, they began their appeal. And in October 2011, Amanda and Raffaele were acquitted based on the lack of credible evidence that tied them to the crime. So uh, they had, um, so yeah, the lack of credible evidence. So they had inaccurate, evid uh, inaccurate measurements being taken. Uh, uh, suspect type of uh, 
potential evidence tampering where we had this uh, lapse in chain of custody with the bra clasp. Uh, we had the pushing of the DNA instrument to pass its validated levels uh, and just a lot of sketchy investigation that was involved in this case. So they were acquitted in 2011, but it didn't stop there. In March of 2013, Italy's highest court, the Court of Cassation, reopened their case and overturned the acquittal. And in January of 2014, Knox and Solicito were reconvicted of murder. They of course appealed again. And in March, 2015, their convictions were overturned once again. And now instead of just acquitting them, they, the court ruled that Amanda and Raffaele were completely innocent of involvement in the murder due to investigative failures, the contamination of evidence, and overall unreliable physical evidence. So we can see here how it's so important for us to make sure that we are conducting a very thorough investigation and we're taking detailed notes. We're making sure we take care to avoid contamination because they can result in things like a wrongful conviction, which not only affects these individuals, but also the family of the victim as well. Having to go through and relive this case over and over again, no one wants to do that. So it's so that's why it's so important for us to make sure that we're getting it right the first time. All right, any references if you wanna take a closer look at some things? Uh, and again, there's also that Netflix documentary as well, if you want to take a look at that. Yeah, so that is our case study for the Amanda Knox case. Uh, and now we're on spring break. So I hope you all have a nice spring break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to go into trace evidence. We'll start with hairs, uh, going to fibers. We'll also cover that glass again, uh, as well as some other uh, important items of trace evidence that are uh, examined in a trace unit. So I will see you there and have a nice spring break.